parasites, in addition to being remarkably cool in their own right, um, <laughs> yeah, they are, uh, are an often overlooked and underappreciated part of ecosystems that can have important effects on organisms and their interactions, for example, predator-prey relationships, herbivore grazing, uh, reproductive potential of their hosts. And also, parasites cause many of serious human diseases, particularly in the tropics, um, such as schistosomiasis and malaria, for example. Um, so for some of these reasons, uh, the general importance of understanding parasite-host relationships and understanding the ecology of organs, organisms, including humans, I chose to look at parasites for my senior project. I looked at the parasites of three species of periwinkle, litorina, as Sean said, which are the small snails shown on the left. And in mummy chogs, fungulus heteroclitus, the fish shown in the net on the right. What I was doing was I was comparing what species of parasite are present in these organisms and how common the infection is among different geographic locations. Today I'm going to talk about just one part of my research, and that is going to be focusing on the common periwinkle. The common periwinkle is the most abundant periwinkle we have here. If you go down to the COA beach, it's the one you will probably notice first, and you'll see literally hundreds of them. Common periwinkles are infected by several species of flatworm, but most commonly by the one pictured here, Cryptocotyle lingua. The periwinkles become infected with these flatworms by accidentally eating the flatworm eggs um, that are found in gall feces while grazing on algae. So what I did was beginning this summer, I collected common periwinkles from sites around MDI. I took periwinkles from different tidal heights at these locations, from the high intertidal, which was as far away from the water as I could still find periwinkles, from the low intertidal, which was right at the water's edge during low tide and from the subtitle, which was several feet underwater during low tide. What I found was that across sites, there were more infected periwinkles in the low intertidal. When I went back to two of these sites and sampled multiple times across several months, this pattern still, had, still was consistent, as you can see from this graph. Here, the percentage of periwinkles that were infected is shown um, for different tidal heights across locations. Uh, the infected periwinkles from the low intertidal are shown in light gray, which you can see is consistently highest. The infected periwinkles from the high intertidal are shown in white, and the two subtidal samples I was able to collect are shown in black. I came up with two possible explanations for this pattern. First, it could be that periwinkles move lower to the um, move to lower in the intertidal once they become infected. It could also be that there, uh, periwinkles that live in the low intertidal may be more likely to become infected. What I did was a mark recapture experiment. With the help of the marine bio class this fall, I co collected periwinkles from the high and the low intertidal. I painted them two different colors to distinguish the two, and then released them all in the mid intertidal. The next day, we came back. We found peri the periwinkles. We actually found 100, um, 508 out of 600 marked periwinkles, so it was a very good rate. I was very pleased with it. Um, and then we measured the distance that they moved and what direction they had traveled. It turned out that the periwinkles that were infected didn't move any differently from those that, had, that were uninfected. From this, I concluded that the peri that periwinkles don't appear to be more likely to move lower in the intertidal once they're infected. This suggests that the greater infection found in the lower, low intertidal might result from more periwinkles becoming infected there. A possible explanation for this could be that gulls may spend more time in the low intertidal foraging for food, and therefore the periwinkles are expo exposed to more gull feces and consequently more um, flatworm eggs. I'd like to thank everyone who helped me throughout the course of my senior project, and at this point, I would be happy to answer any questions.